uh, welcome uh, to the 17th edition of uh, PG Classroom uh, by Kerala Society of Ophthalmic Surgeons. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, uh, one of the best uh, uh, faculties in India on uh, neuro-ophthalmology and uh, pediatric ophthalmology, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Rohit Saxena from RP Center Ames. Uh, and uh, uh, the presentation uh, will be from Giridharai Institute. And Dr. Anne Maria will be uh, presenting on accommodative use of Europa and uh, Dr. Renjini, who is a um, pediatric ophthalmology consultant and uh, Giridharai Institute, will be discussing. And uh, then uh, Dr. Rohit will be uh, giving his comments and uh, discussing on the on the presentation. And uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't think uh, Dr. Rohit uh, needs uh, any introduction. Uh, Dr. Rohit uh, Saxena is a, a professor of ophthalmology from uh, uh, Dr. RP Center Ames, and uh, he did his uh, uh, undergraduation uh, uh, from Ames, uh, did his uh, junior residency, senior residency uh, from All India Institute of uh, uh, Medical Sciences, uh, Dr. RP Center uh, for Ophthalmic Sciences, and. Uh, See, he's he says he's a real a real good teacher because uh, I know that uh, uh, he was my senior and uh, uh, is is a very uh, quiet chap. But uh, but he uh, he's uh, is a wonderful academician. He's got more than 130 uh, publications in uh, peer reviewed uh, journals. Huge number of uh, uh, chapters in uh, national and international books. Uh, more than 30 awards uh, he has won. And uh, uh, I mean, as I said. Uh, he is definitely one of the best uh, in uh, neuro-ophthalmology and uh, strabismology and uh, pediatric ophthalmology in India. Uh, Dr. Rohit, uh, uh, we, we are uh, really privileged to have you uh, uh, discuss this case with uh, uh, the PGs. And uh, man, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, all the PGs who are attending, and not just the PGs, uh, everyone uh, who is attending uh, is going to benefit a lot uh, uh, from uh, your interaction and this presentation. And uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, prolonging this further. And uh, I request uh, uh, Dr. Ann uh, to start a presentation. No, thanks. Actually, that was a little over the top, but thank you. I hope you all enjoy this. Good evening, everyone. Uh, presenting the case of a six-year-old girl uh, with a complaint of uh, deviation of her left eye and associated with frequent blinking of the eyes for the past two years. Coming to the history of present illness, uh, child's mother noticed deviation of her left eye since last two years, which was intermittent in nature, associated with no diurnal variation. She also noticed that child was blinking her eyes frequently while watching television and was also watching TV at a close distance. They consulted an ophthalmologist one year back who advised glasses, which she was using regularly. But mother noticed persistence of deviation of her left eye uh, with glasses, st uh, still with glasses. And three months later, she was brought here for a second opinion and she was continued on her glasses with a change in part. The child has been compliant with the use of glasses and she was now brought for a follow-up visit. No history of any double vision and there is no history of any trauma, fever or convulsions. Coming to past ocular history, no history of any other significant ocular diseases other than squinting in the past, no history of any ocular surgeries. Coming to past medical history, there is no history of any significant medical illness. Uh, birth history, the child was born as a full-term baby by normal delivery with the birth weight being 2.9 kg. No history of any developmental delay and the child is com uh, com vaccinated up to the age. Uh, personal history, sleep and appetite is normal. Bowel and bladder habits are normal. Uh, coming to family history, uh, there is uh, no significant family history of squinting or any other ocular diseases. No history of any allergic history. Uh, coming to general examination, uh, the child was alert and active. Uh, there was no pallor, ichthyosis, cyanosis, clubbing, uh, significant lymphadenopathy or fetal edema. Uh, there was no abnormal shape of head or facial asymmetry noted. Uh, the pulse was a 90 per minute, which is uh, normal in rate, regular in rhythm. Uh, coming to systemic examination, uh, cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular system, uh, respiratory system and per abdomen were within normal limits. Uh, so, uh, the uh, nervous system, higher mental functions were normal. Uh, sensory and motor system examination was within normal limits. Uh, cranial nerves uh, examination, uh, right side, 
um, uh, the first nerve, normal smell sensation was perceived. Uh, second, third, fourth, and sixth nerves will be dealt later. Uh, coming to fifth nerve, opening of mouth was normal. Uh, facial sensations were normal. Uh, seventh nerve, closing of eyes was found to be normal. Normal nasolabial force. There was no deviation of angle of mouth. Uh, eighth nerve, hearing was normal. Nine and ten, no nasal twang, dysphagia or dysarthria was found. Then 11th, normal shrugging of shoulders was observed and 12th, protrusion of tongue was also normal. Left side, uh, normal smell sensation um, and uh, opening of mouth was normal, normal smell sensation, uh, normal sensations over the face. Uh, seventh, now closing, was, uh, closing of eyes was normal with normal nasolabial force and there was no deviation of angle of mouth. Hearing was normal. Uh, ninth and tenth, no nasal twang, dysphagia, dysarthria. Normal shrugging of shoulders was observed, and uh, protrusion of tongue was also normal. Coming to ocular examination proper, head posture was normal. Birth for dotist uh, fusion was observed. Uh, stereopsis was assessed with titmus plitus, and it was found to be 40 arc seconds. Uh, fixation in right eye, it was central, steady, and maintained. Uh, in left eye, it was uh, central, steady, and unmaintained. Uh, ocular posture, as assessed by Hirschberg test, it was found to be orthotropic. On performing cover, uncover, and alternate cover tests without glasses, um, left isotropia was observed with alternating isotropia for both distance and near. And with glasses, it, uh, it was found to be orthotropic. On performing prism bar cover test without glasses, uh, 14 prism di uh, diopters left isotropia was observed for distance and 10 prism di uh, diopters left isotropia was observed for near. Uh, this was the uh, video showing cover and uncover test for uh, distance. Sorry, the video is not uh, playing in this PowerPoint. If, Did you you can, try if, you, if you want, you can uh, just reduce that and go to the video and play the video. Uh, if you want to do that, yeah, that's right. I think it would be good because that's an important part of the examination. Or you could complete and then show us the videos in the end. I think that will give you whatever is convenient to you. Okay, sir. Um, so uh, the ocular movements were full, uh, free, and painless in all positions of case. Uh, and versions and ductions were uh, full and free in both the eyes. This was the uh, 90s picture. Um, and coming to assessment of vision, uh, in right eye, uh, which unaided vision was found to be uh, 6 by 9, improving with uh, pinhole to 6 6, and the near vision being N6. Undilated retinoscopy showed plus 4.5 spheres, and the child was accepting after cycloplasic refraction to plus 4 spheres and improving to 6 6. In left eye, the unaided vision was 612, uh, improving to 66 parts with pinhole and the near vision being N6. Undilated retinoscopy in left eye showed plus four spheres with plus one cylinder at 90 degree. And she was accepting plus 4.5 spheres with plus 0.75 cylinder at 90 degree and improving to 66 parts. Uh, the anterior segment examination in right eye, lid and lacrimal apparatus was normal, ropeless was negative, uh, conjunctiva was normal, uh, Cornea was normal in size and shape and uh, transparency. Normal corneal luster was observed. Anterior chamber was normal in depth, optically quiet with von Herich's grading being three. Uh, iris was normal in color and pattern. Pupil was three millimeter round and uh, briskly reacting to direct and consensual reflexes. Uh, lens was clear. Uh, IOP was no digitally normal. Uh, in left eye, uh, lid and lacrimal apparatus was normal and the ropeless was negative. Conjunctiva was normal. Uh, cornea was normal in size, shape, and transparency. Anterior chamber was normal in depth with von Herich's grading being three. Uh, iris was normal in color and pattern. Pupil was three millimeter in round, uh, briskly reacting to direct and consensual reflexes. Uh, lens was clear. IOP was digitally normal. Uh, fundus examination. Uh, with slit lamp, slit lamp by microscopy using a uh, 78D lens, it was observed that, that the disc was normal in size and shape with distinct borders in right eye, with the cup disc ratio being 0.2 with pink and healthy neuroretinal rim. Vessels were seen arising centrally from the disc, branching dichotomously and maintaining an AV ratio of 2 is to 3. Four wheel reflex was present. In left eye, uh, disc was normal in size and shape, and the uh, borders were distinct. 
Uh, cup disc ratio was 0.2 with pink and healthy neuroretinal rim. Vessels were seen arising from the center of the disc, branching typothermously, maintaining, maintaining an AV ratio of 2 is to 3, and foveal reflex was present. Uh, coming to summary, a six year old girl was brought by her mother with complaints of uh, squinting of left eye and frequent blinking while watching TV since last two years. And uh, she has been using glasses since uh, last one year. Uh, and uh, there, uh, there was persistence of uh, deviation of her left eye with glass. And upon visit, visiting here, the glasses were uh, changed with a change in power. And she has been complaining with its regular use till date. On examination, the retinoscopy showed plus four spheres uh, with uh, best corrected visual, uh, visual acuity being 6, 6 in right side, and uh, plus 4.5 spheres and plus 0.75 cylinder at 90 degree in left eye, improving to six, uh, with best corrected visual acuity being 6, 6 parts. Uh, Hirschberg test uh, showed orthotropia, and cover, uncover, and alternate cover test showed left isotropia with alternating isotropia without glasses, and with glasses, it was orthotropic. Prism, uh, prism bar cover test without glasses showed 14 prism diopters left isotropia for distance and 10 prism diopters left isotropia for near. And ocular movements were full and free in all directions. Anterior and posterior segment examination was within normal limits. Um, coming to provisional diagnosis, right eye hypermetropia, a left eye a fully refractive accommodative isotropia with compound hypermetropic astigmatism. You wanted to show the videos uh, for the cover test? You can play it in your desktop, Anne Maria, if it is possible. You come out and play in your desktop. Uh, Dr. Anjani, like, uh, uh, as he's getting yeah, ready, sorry. you can start dis uh, discussing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you you open the video <coughs> and uh, on your desktop and then try sharing. So no nobody will be sharing if uh, as and when you are able to share, you share. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I just want to summarize that uh, this girl, uh, it, 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 she came to us uh, um, uh, in 2020 and uh, she uh, she was already prescribed glass, hypermetropic glasses elsewhere and uh, uh, she came to us for a second opinion uh, because mother had a constant complaint that uh, uh, the child uh, had squinting, ha what had, had squint before prescription of spectacles and still uh, the eye was squinting with the glasses. So they basically, they uh, came for a second opinion. So when, uh, uh, when we uh, examined the child, uh, the child uh, was using a correction of around plus, plus uh, 1.5. Uh, uh, hypermetropic uh, correction in both the eyes and uh, uh, she was having intermittent uh, convergent squint going into left convergent squint uh, uh, without glasses and even with the glasses. So uh, we examined the child and we did a dilated uh, uh, cycloplegic uh, refraction and we found that uh, the hypermetropia was under corrected. And uh, she was actually uh, a, a hypermetropic refraction after cycloplegic retinoscopy, uh, cycloplegia uh, was around plus four. So uh, even the child was suppressing in the left eye before, but then uh, we changed the glasses. So we increased, we gave her more plus correction. 
and then um, uh, we reviewed her again so on follow up visit we found that um, uh, the child was improving her uh, bsv uh, she was able to fuse uh, with her glasses with a new correction and uh, 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 now the child it's been almost now 2 years uh, the child is maintaining the alignment with the glasses so uh, basically the child was under corrected and uh, the hypermetropia was not full corrected and uh, that was the cause for the persistent squinting with the glasses uh, now the child is fusing uh, she has a bsv which is maintained stereopsis is around 30 uh, uh, arc seconds and uh, she is doing well so uh, just wanted to uh, uh, present this case because uh, 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 there is a norm that uh, uh, still among the ophthalmologists that uh, so uh, just wanted to uh, show through this case that it should not be under corrected or over correction how how should be the isotropia uh, dealt with so uh, that's how we manage this case so basically now child is able to maintain the bsv and stereopsis yeah so and you're showing the videos yes sir um, is the video uh, playing now yeah please go ahead and play if you can this is the tower and um toy test platform for near vision you have to share your screen and uh, you have shared the other screen i think you have not uh, shared the and, and and first first you unshare this then open the video and then then you share so um uh, i think an excellent case uh, with a follow up demonstrating the key components that we need to remember and understand whenever we are approaching a case of esotropia our understanding whether it's accommodative or non accommodative is all subsequent to our evaluation so uh, as uh, has been yes visible yeah, now yeah yeah So this was a tower and tower test performed for the um, near fixation. Then we can see a left uh, isotropia uh, both alternating. And so you have any time you have a child coming with isotropia. your first step should be age appropriate cycloplegic refraction so and what was the cycloplegic uh, refraction that you uh, cycloplegia that you had used sir um uh, this for this child it was given a cycloventilate 1% drop followed by a uh, drop of night a point 8% uh, then 15 minutes later uh, another drop of cycloventilate uh, 1% was given Uh, and uh, after uh, complete dilatation uh, cycloplegic refraction was performed uh, and uh, the refraction was observed to be uh, plus 4 sphere in right eye with uh, plus 4.75 uh, sphere and uh, 0.75 cylinder at 90 degree in left eye absolutely so excellent i mean uh, of course at our center we still tend to prefer atropine ointment but obviously uh, for an older child or when there is difficulty in a follow up uh, cycloventilate suffices just as much the only uh, care for cycloventilate is that you should ask the parents to stay back for a little while uh, after the refraction also because the drug has been known to have a little uh, cns side effects including uh, uh, psychological changes in a child and unfortunately we've seen a few children behave have behavioral changes which sometimes can scare up the parents so that's the one of the reasons why uh, and of course atropine being a stronger and more uh, definitive cycloplegic we tend to still prefer but yeah whenever there is issues in parents coming back and we want uh, want to do it faster in an older child i think it would be nearly as appropriate and if you have a residual esotropia so first step of any esotropia child presenting is a cycloplegic refraction because you don't know whether it's infantile esotropia or an accommodative esotropia so the first step would be this and uh, and as uh, dr ranjini has pointed out under corrected glasses is still a major problem 
uh, and unfortunately, we jump to surgeries uh, before we actually assess them properly. And uh, one of the things I would say when you're doing cycloplegic refraction is uh, with cyclopentylate, just ask the child to see near and read up, read. So if there is a complete cycloplegia, then the child will not be able to see for near. So that will be, you know, a little confirmatory that you have reached the depth of the cycloplegic agent. Okay. Uh, uh, shall I see the uh, cover and cover video for this uh, with correction? Yeah, for this yeah right, sure. This was the cover on the test uh, with classes for distance or uh, distant position, and we can see orthotropia with uh, one correction. Great, yeah, this shows the child is uh, well corrected. So, how will you manage onwards now? Now that she's doing good, she has good uh, binocularity now. Uh, how will you proceed onwards with this? Um, now, uh, the patient, now the child is having a good binocularity um, and um, uh, there, um, after, like, uh, we can um, review the child and uh, as, uh, uh, if there is um, maintenance of binocularity with uh, full uh, hypermetropic correction, we can uh, uh, see by reducing the power uh, in one to two diopters. Uh, and see uh, if uh, the binocularity is still restored. Uh, once the child uh, uh, reaches uh, in, in the age group eight to 10 years, um, so yes, absolutely. Uh, you're right. Uh, of course, one thing we uh, sh should have discussed, of course, this did not have a distance near uh, difference in deviation. But that is one thing that you must always measure for uh, a distance with the correction and a near with the correction to look for any uh, residual or extra esotropia for near. So uh, what would that condition be and how would we tend to manage that? Um, if there is uh, increased deviation at, uh, at near uh, compared to distance, um, then it would be uh, high AC by A ratio accommodative esotropia. Um, uh, if there is associated uh, high AC by A, a ratio, uh, and uh, in uh, these patients, the refractive error will be uh, low to moderate hyperopia, and uh, uh, the um, the um, underlying uh, um, cause, and, yeah, uh, the difference is, uh, yeah, uh, 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 there is. Uh, high uh, accommodative convergence with respect to the uh, accommodation. Uh, so in these children, uh, the uh, management, uh, we give uh, bifocal lenses uh, for improving the retinal focus uh, so that uh, the accommodation improve, improves and the, uh, asso uh, the associated convergence also improves. Um, then um, um, we can... Uh, um, um, with bifocal lenses, if the child is maintaining uh, binocularity, uh, we can uh, reduce the power of the uh, near near ad in uh, 0.5 to 1 diopter. Uh, uh, if, uh, yeah, uh, steps. If the, that is the excellent. I, I mean, uh, you surely have read the subject very well and you're very, very well trained. And get there, I, I must give my compliments. Absolutely. So uh, these are two possible uh, um, features of accommodative esotropia that you may come across. You could come across the uh, refractive accommodative, the case that you have presented, and the non-refractive accommodative of the high AC by ratio you just mentioned, in which the deviations for near is more than the deviation for distance. And the basic reason is because they have a high AC by A ratio or an accommodative convergence by accommodation and uh, what would be the normal ac by a ratio that we would usually see in a normal patient person um, the no um, normal ac by a ratios um, um... so it's somewhere close to four to six depending upon you're doing by the gradient method or you're doing by the heterophoria method so this is approximately the normal range 
and in fact that's why we say that the distance near deviation difference should not be more than or if it's more than 15 we will take that as a significant value because on an average it is 5 uh, the ac by ratio would be 5 so you would say that you are reading at 3 uh, at uh, 33 cm so you are accommodating for three diopters so normally up to 15 prisms of convergence will happen in a normal person so that's the amount of convergence we expect normally to be there so any convergence or near deviation that is more than 15 prisms would definitely be considered as high 15 or more would be considered as high ac by ratio and you would start thinking in terms of prescribing bifocals and you very aptly talked about the follow up so you give bifocals or uh, spectacles also you see them as you have done in this case for a period of time and follow up and see for development of binocularity in fact this child has done very very well and i i like i said compliments on the care because a couple of studies have shown that accommodative isotropia also has a rather limited or not so great uh, binocularity in stereopsis so because there have been long periods in which they have not been managed or uh, if a uh, good follow up has not been done and as we know that the power changes we know that hyperopia may increase till about 4 to 5 years and then actually will start coming down in some children so sometimes they may have periods of isotropia which are uncorrected and that may reduce the binocularity they may have so uh, uh, absolutely you have and why would you want to reduce the refractive correction you have given um, which is called weaning off the term that we tend to use especially for bifocals in high ac by ratio we call it weaning off bifocals and why would we want to do that um usually uh, by the age of 7 years uh, the children acquire emetropization and then uh, uh um yes absolutely you're right it's it's to do with emetropization only in fact we may not always wait that long like in this case if you're foiling up and even if she's 6 years or so you can start weaning off because you want to increase fusional range in them and some amount of hyperopia is a part of the accommodative process of the growth of the eye so natural you don't want to interfere too much in the natural physiological growth of the eye so uh, one you want the process not to be hindered and two you want these children to have a little bit of fusional virgence so they should have uh, be able to uh, both have fusional convergence and fusional divergence which is there in all of us so we start weaning them off at steps at a time but it's very very important to be you know very carefully follow these up uh, follow these children up as you wean on wean them off glasses because it is very important that you shouldn't miss small angle isotropias that uh, you that would reduce the binocularity especially since you have achieved such wonderful uh, manage outcomes in the in, in this children uh great uh just one uh, thing i i would say that uh, one thing you should always tell the parents when you start them on uh, refractive correction in accommodative isotropias is you have to inform the parents that after the child starts wearing glasses the moment you remove the glass the the strabismus or the squint will be far more evident in fact it's going to be evident almost always whereas earlier without glasses the parents may say that the child sometimes squints and that's why they've brought the child to us but the moment you've given the glass for a period of time the first follow up most parents will come and say that uh, the moment we remove the glass the child now starts squinting so sometimes they say that it is actually increased and why would that be um, without glasses there would be uh... Uh, increased accommodative uh, uh, effort so that uh, convergence will be more uh, compared to uh, uh, um, like with classes uh, the accommodation will be uh, relieved and um, convergence will be uh, corrected so if the classes are removed there will be uh, added uh, effort of accommodation uh, absolutely so 
the only thing is that earlier the child used to accommodate only when the child wanted to see clear objects for near and would not you know put that effort so like all of us are rather lazy and uh, we'll only work when we need to so when the child had to see fine objects child would accommodate to see clear accommodative convergence will cause the isotropy to the to present to present and once that visually demanding task is over the eyes would get aligned because the child would no more accommodate that much would not you know kind of spend energy to see clear but once the glasses are on the child is now accustomed to uh, having a clear vision all the time it's it's like akin to us myopes i can't you know start my day without my glasses the first thing i'll do is look for my glasses and the last thing i'll you know leave is you know set uh, you know just before i go to sleep is put my glasses away sometimes it's been that while reading i'll just you know sleep with my glasses because i am so used to you know doing everything with glasses so same is for these children they're so used to now with glasses seeing clear all the time that the moment you remove it the brain is now accustomed to a sharp clear image and the accommodative visotropia will kick in almost all the time so that's something we must make parents wary dr uh, ranjini i mean you can you can add yeah. any anything any yes, other sir. thing that we wish to add on yes sir i, I agree with you so uh, regarding the follow up uh, as you said uh, that how to follow up these children uh, uh ideally every 6 months uh, uh, i advise a cycloplegic refraction for these children and I try to assess that uh, whether the child is able to fuse so uh, i would never under corrector i will never decrease uh, the correction if i feel that the child is accepting the full hypermetropic correction i would always try to push more uh, plus lenses uh and then i would see if the child is accepting the full correction i would never under correct the child uh because uh, i am i i am able to see that the child is able to attain a very good stereopsis um and uh, yeah yeah regarding the ac by a ratio as you told sir that uh, uh we have to assess uh, it's very important that uh, we have to assess the near distance disparity and uh, uh um, generally uh, uh, uh when we see i generally follow the gradient method so i just uh, uh, see the deviation with and without lenses and as you so told if it is more than 15 prisms i i i try to add the bifocals to them and uh, uh, every time uh, my main thing would be to assess their stereopsis and bsv so i would never under i would never decrease the plus i will i, I would I, i would rather let the child be there on that correction provided if there is any metropisization then only i would try to de decrement it by 0.5 diopters absolutely in i in fact the first time you do refraction for them it's like you know the dictum for like myopes you say that you give the minimum uh, power of myopic correction which gives them optimal vision for hyperopes uh, or for accommodative isotropia your dictum goes that you give the highest plus power especially yes. the first time you're prescribing with the best corrected vision so if uh, you know plus 3 is also giving him 66 and plus 4 is also giving him 66 yeah. you need to give plus 4 the no, highest no, plus no, which no, you uh, start and as dr anjini saying your uh, your reduction has to be very slow because you need to give time for the child to develop that fusional vergence without risking the development of isotropia intermittently so it's a it's a little painstaking and uh you know intensive follow up method and six monthly is a is a good follow up time when you would want to keep seeing to so you every visit even if you don't do a refraction you need to see how good is the alignment what is the vision if there is no if the vision is good and the alignment both for distance and near is good you may still continue with the same glasses or then start for that 0.5 reduction but after that 0.5 reduction you need to follow them up a little earlier than you know that so maybe a couple of months or so so that you see for uh, the maintenance of the alignment and good vision and then you then follow them up after 6 months and again do that uh, you know slight reduction or 0.5 to 1 diopter again depending upon the age of the child so that yes, you yes. are balancing the child's development of vergence along with this so that's optimally done if you have an older child 
uh, and who wants who doesn't want to wear glasses is there any option that you could advise them yeah that is for ann maria sir that yeah yeah please all questions are for ann and and whatever i mean i i hope that's okay uh, yeah yeah sure sir i i i hope she should be able to answer so she she her presentation was outstanding in fact i'm sorry i didn't compliment in the beginning her presentation was excellent just the way it should be particularly her uh, showing an evaluation of the rest of the cranial nerves which many of the residents and fellows forget so it is very very essential for us to uh, again and again reiterate that the third fourth the second third fourth sixth are cranial nerves part of the rest of the cranial nerves and any child who comes with esotropia may have a developmental anomaly and it's very important to do a comprehensive neurological assessment at least a, a gross one whatever we can and cranial nerve involvement is very important because if besides this there is another cranial nerve involved then you know that the child needs extra attention and needs to be assessed for the neurological issues in far greater detail and and children with strabismus are more likely to have uh, developmental issues or uh, uh, neurological problems i mean it's it's more like children with developmental issues are extremely likely to have uh strabismus either whether it is committent or incompetent strabismus so uh, a strabismus requires a good evaluation and i think uh, that was very neatly presented uh, in a very uh, very short and a very uh, i should say optimal manner so excellent presentation dr anand mari yeah uh, so any options in older patients so you have a young adult coming who still has so uh, uh, very uncommon but we sometimes do see adults who have a commutative esotropia or slight esotropias and they are now rather interested that they i mean they don't want to wear glasses so tough question but because you presented so well uh, if there is a residual esotropia um, for both distance and near uh, we can um go for um, surgical correction with by medial um by uh, medial rectus recession of both types or uh, its lateral medial rectus recession associated with uh, lateral rectus so depending upon uh, what is the amount of deviation you may have but like i said if you have leveled off the hyperopia the child is is now an adult and you don't expect the hyperopia to come down and the child and the patient is comfortable with a mild hyperopia but a small esotropia and once correction you can think of uh, a surgery but conventionally we will never advise surgery but like i said if the child if the person is older and you know now that he has reached uh, an adult an uh, early adulthood after which the refractive uh, change is unlikely to actually happen and the patient is very insistent that he she does not want to continue wearing glasses so that is just one of the options because if the child is if the patient is not wearing and then over time although uh, there's not going to be any suppression but he'll start ignoring the image so to maintain binocularity you may offer them this option and of course if there is presence of uh, any oblique overactions which again it's not uh, that you will not find them in accommodative esotropia especially if the esotropia has been long standing over time you may see that there are changes in the other muscles also and you may find an a or b pattern which becomes an indication for surgery so despite glasses uh, which will correct in the primary gaze the presence of an a or b pattern is the other indication that you may think in terms of planning for surgery in these cases so there are very very limited indications for intervention in a younger child if it's just the horizontal deviation there is no indication at all to intervene in any form whatsoever surgically you always uh, give refractive correction and follow these children up yes dr anjani any uh, anything you wish to add uh, uh, <laughs> the importance of uh, 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 atropin refraction sir like uh, do you do it for all children or uh, is there any specific age group like uh, do you follow that tropin refraction so especially isotropes 
all isotropes up to 6 to 7 years of age our first refraction will always be with atropine subsequent refractions may not require atropine but the first refraction because i must uh, definitely uh, pick up the maximum amount of hyperopia that the child has in an older patient i may try first i would often try cyclopentolate or homatropine uh, but if there is a small residual uh, isotropia that is remaining just like it happened in your case and it yeah. can be like i said present in an older patient also or even in a younger patient if the refraction has been done some time back and i still see that there is a small isotropia of about a 10 15 prisms i would still go in again and do a an atropinized refraction because uh, i mean like i said you will never plan surgery in a child with a comparative isotropia so i would want to make sure that uh, i am not missing an small residual accommodative isotropia and would go in for that if despite that i see that there is a small residual which is maintained uh, which is more or less fixed angle for both distance in here then i would uh, intervene surgically but otherwise yes i'm a little more conventional because i don't want to risk operating on uh, an accommodative isotropia so, so dr and what would be uh, what is the problem if i operate this child today and the child is very happy she is uh, she is going to be uh, you know uh, without her glasses she'll be aligned the mother will be happier the child will be happy she doesn't have to wear these bothersome glasses so what is the downside of operating these children why are we repeatedly accentuating the never in you know surgical intervention in small children with accommodative isotropia um because um uh the uh, refractive correction uh has to be given uh, so uh, so is the refractive correct is the child going to be hyperopic all her life yes no then what will happen to her once her uh, hypermetropia as she grows older hypermetropia decreases if i operate her for the accommodative isotropia today what will happen to her down the line right now without her glasses she has an isotropia because of accommodative isotropia you mentioned so once the hyperopia comes down what's going to happen to our, what was our purpose of weaning i mean why are we gradually following up and removing the glasses because she doesn't need those glasses with time as her hyperopia comes down so if we operate today and uh, surgically correct the isotropia today over time her accommodative isotropia is going to come down and she's going to come back to us over time with with an exotropia right today if i operate you mentioned that she has say 20 prisms of isotropia without her glasses and i operate her for 20 prisms and she is very happy without glasses but as she grows older at 7 8 9 10 years of age her hyperopia will obviously keep coming down as she grows older and according to along with that her accommodative isotropia will also come down so maybe when she is an emetro by say 11 12 years of age we have made her we have corrected her or made an created an exotropia of 20 prism so she is now going to come back to us as a consecutive exotropia of 20 prism and sometimes even higher so that is the reason why you should never operate these children because you know over time their hyperopia is is bound to come down so over time their accommodative isotropia will come down and they will then become a, a consecutive exotropia and so sometimes we see older children coming back with con consecutive ex exotropias and you realize that it may possibly be that i had overestimated the extent of the fixed angle isotropia or underdone the or under prescribed glasses for the accommodative component and that's why now the child is coming with consecutive isotropia exotropia sorry so that's the reason why you, i mean it's like never operate an accommodative isotropia especially till the time you're sure that the hyperopia is not going to change okay wonderful excellent presentation i'm I, I, like very good work up yeah any any questions you have you can throw it us i mean like you know the viewer yes, runs both ways 
sir i had one question that uh, in in children uh, who have who are partially accommodative esotropia and if uh, even after correction after full hypermetropic correction they have a residual esotropia for distance and near and if the disparity is 10 or more how do you how do you make, how do you plan your target angle sir like for surgery is that so, yeah. so uh, we are looking at you know at convergence excess kind of an uh, esotropia so whether it's accommodate i mean it's easier to discuss this if it's uh, a non accommodative convergence excess type so in yeah. that case uh, there are multiple ways if it's only 10 prisms then i would probably think in terms of slightly uh, uh, you know slightly over correcting it or correcting it for the excess eso and expect that the uh, accommodative and the vergence mechanism will allow the eye to remain aligned for distance also so if it's 10 or under i would plan that accordingly because i i one would expect that the fusional vergence in these patients would be able to manage the slight exo for distance and would be because the child would be aligned for near and for intermediate angle which is most of the time what we are uh, you know kind of viewing so the child would be definitely aligned without requiring any vergence mechanism for near and intermediate and for distance i would expect the fusional vergence to correct for the uh, exotrope slight consecutive exo that i would have tended to create by slight over correction or operating for the uh, the larger angle which is for near that is the near <coughs> angle yes for the near angle if it's by 10 prisms or so if it is more, more than 10 than prisms, prisms. Mean or more in that case i would probably plan the scots procedure or the recession resection of the same muscle so along with the uh, you know uh, when i'm doing uh, resection i would do a little bit of resection so essentially doing a recessed resect procedure on the same muscle to so the uh, 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 main surgery is to correct the overall angle which is for distance and then a slight resection of the lateral rectus uh, okay. uh, to correct for the esotropia that is there okay uh, so sir when you apply the other yes, option in them is again if it's 15 or more is to do a fardon procedure yes which is also a very very which is actually more proven it's just that you must remember when you're doing a fardon for near uh, a fardon uh, procedure in these patients who have a distance near disparity and an excess eso for near is that you may have to slightly under correct for the uh, distance deviation because although theoretically fardon is not supposed to make any significant change in the baseline deviation but uh, one is i mean I, i in my experience i have seen that they tend to have a slight excess effect for distance so slightly under correct for the distance correction along with the fardon that corrects for the esotropia excess esotropia for near near okay sir. so uh, that's as far as management is concerned yeah the cover uncover tests and all that we of course didn't discuss that and uh, the videos came in the end but i i one would say i would say that the cover test is for tropias so whenever you have a manifest trismus you do a cover test in which you cover what is the apparently fixing eye and look for movement of the deviating eye that is uh, that would come to take uh, you know fixation now that the fixing eye or the dominant eye is covered and this of course would not happen if it's a blind eye or if the eye cannot move in a restrictive or a paralytic strabismus or there is arc so that would be our understanding of a cover test uh, a cover uncover or an uncover test uh, because we are accentuating or we are kind of insisting or identifying the uncover part of the uncover test is for essentially for four years where you want to see what is happening to the eye once the cover has been removed so when you have a phoria or you have a parent coming that the child occasionally squints but right now the child appears to be aligned i will cover any one of the eyes because neither of the eye is uh, apparently squinting i cover the eye wait for a little bit hope for the fusion to break then uncover that eye so the uncover test i expect that now that i have broken fusion the phoria will manifest and the eye will come back to take up fixation so that would be the uncover test and of course sometimes say in uh, intermittent divergent squints the uh, the fusional mechanism is strong enough and just an uncover test may not be 
strong enough to break the fusion completely and you may not manifest the exotropia in that case you may do an alternate cover test and rapidly fluctuate the cover over either eye so that the fusion breaks far more easily and at that time you can ask the patient to look into the far distance when the fusional mechanisms get even weaker and then you will be able to see the full manifest deviation especially this is important when you are planning for uh, operating these patients so to measure the exact true angle that you want to operate for you would prefer to do uh, break the full deviation uh, uh, fusion and get the full manifest deviation for a far distance because that will show that this is the full angle for which you need to operate and ensure that you do not have an have a residual uh, residual exotropia and again uh, a, a major caution we have burnt our fingers in patients with intermittent divergence squints which have a high ac by ratio so we were talking about accommodative esotropias and uh, high ac by ratio or non refractive accommodative esotropias it's important to remember that uh, an uh, an exotropic child also can have a high ac by ratio and in fact that's why he or she is presenting as an intermittent strabismus so when he looks into the distance he has the deviation but when he looks into the looks for a near target it is the accommodative versions that is keeping the eye under control and we consider it as an intermittent divergence squint and operate the child for the true distance uh, deviation but post op we have burnt our fingers i have personally burnt my finger when we have not concentrated on this on the ac by ratio in a intermittent divergence squint and we realized that post operatively the child is perfectly aligned for distance but is now esotropic for near and then we had to refract the child and we realized that the child had a high ac by ratio and bifocals and the mother was uh, you know really after us saying that you reverse the surgery because she was better off pre operatively when she occasionally used to squint and now she is almost always squinting for near so so uh, like i said it's always as you have shown in the ac by ratio measurements it's very very important for us to measure in all children so that we know their ac by ratio is within normal range or not irrespective of the primary deviation what they have and just to go before we've diagnosed a competent esotropia any child presenting with esotropia in your opd your differentials first start with need to be whether it's a competent or an incompetent sometimes these uh, especially infantile esotropias present with very strong cross fixations so they will not be abducting the eye and they would be looking at opposite sides and they kind of appear as if they have a bilateral six nerve palsy and uh, and or try as much as you may they will just not be willing to abduct so the only way to do it is to allow to send them back with a one is to one patch one day one eye one day one eye and they come back with a patch in one of the eyes and the parents have taken photographs at home and you know that the eye moves the slowly the child will start realizing that he has to actually do some little bit of effort and start looking onto the lateral sides by moving his eyes so you'll be able to pick them up and if there is a true abduction deficit then your and if it's unilateral i i would say a unilateral abduction deficit in a small child coming absolutely neurologically normal think duans unless proved otherwise so a lot of these children are you know kind of considered a six nerve palsy and undergo a lot of investigations before they are you know you realize that they are duans and not a a a a six nerve palsy but of course a keen observation is very very important something you have demonstrated in your workup it's very very important for us to comprehensively work up these these patients uh, uh rohit uh, uh, man uh, and would love to have you as uh, the examiner for our <laughs> pg exam no uh, i i don't think <laughs> no 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 see like uh, uh you you have been very uh, uh, very soft with her if if you if you really want to be uh, a real strict examiner uh see what what would you actually uh, ask can because I man it's it's it, it's just a preparation for her uh so what uh, uh, what would you actually ask her uh, uh, to really assess uh, uh, her knowledge and uh, uh, I mean, uh, let, let, let's see fan can answer 
answer it? No, no. I I think we've gone through most of the questions, which which as an examiner I would ask, and I'm I mean I don't think that uh, uh, we have been particularly soft on her. She and she has I think done pretty well. Uh, uh, overall, um, I mean the other things that like I said you can move on to is the other like we've discussed the other differentials of esotropia. So. we've talked about you know infantile esotropia so the next question that could come is that why do you think it is not infantile esotropia and how would you differentiate and how would your interventions be uh, you know different from accommodative esotropias and uh, what are outcomes post surgery in infantile esotropias what is the level of uh, binocularity that you expect and how is it different in infantile esotropia outcomes versus accommodative particularly on your diagnosis so like we talked about the differential so competent and incompetent and competent infantile esotropia what are the other differences so regarding the angle of deviation so so that would be so how would you so just take i think we have a couple of minutes just take tell us what you would uh, how an infantile eso would be different um, uh, if the um, uh, for a child with infantile esotropia the uh, age of on the uh, onset would be uh, much earlier that that is within 6 months of the life and uh, the there will be a large deviation at near usually more than 30 percent diopters uh, then um, there will be associated features like inferior optic overaction then uh, dissociated vertical deviation then latent nystagmus uh, would be there um, Uh, and a refractive error uh, th- there will be no refractive significant refractive error in the patient the child we use the word significant refractive error simply exemplifying that it is not significantly affecting the deviation but they is going to have age appropriate uh, refractive error so you can expect up to three diopters of hyperopia in these patients because in children because infants you are supposed to have that much so the significance is actually significant refractive error is that it is not actually changing the amount of deviation and absolutely large angles and the associated changes that you are talking about absolutely and invariably for infantile esotropia your management is as early as possible surgical intervention for alignment and unfortunately the outcomes are of course not as great for binocularity especially as in our condition we tend to get them much later but if you operate by say 6 to 8 months of age and get good alignment in your first surgery or within 8 months or so you are expecting a very very good uh, binocular outcomes also so that would be uh, what we would uh, discuss i would say that would be more or less covering the entire topic of uh, esotropias in general and of course definitely a case of accommodative esotropia dr ranjini anything sir i just had one question in infantile esotropias uh, how much recession you do because uh, i have seen patients coming with consecutive exotropias uh, uh, many years later so yes. uh, so that what is like, how much is the maximum recession you do sir like for so uh, less than uh, uh, in less than one year in infants i do not go beyond 5.5 mm and in less than one year children you must measure from the limbus because yes. sometimes their uh, position of the muscle may not be appropriate and there may be anti resegment development that happens in the first two years and that may push the muscle much further back so that is why it is important that you measure from the limbus so uh, uh, i would say 5.5 is my expected position of the mr and i would do 5.5 so 11 mm from the limbus is my max that i would go for uh, in infants in older children uh, i would i can go up to 6 mm but definitely not beyond that so okay. uh, usually that those are my limits that i would always maintain okay. a case case of complex Uh, uh comes to you and uh, see I, I, at at what age uh, would you intervene and uh, what will you do that's for me or for ann yeah yeah <laughs> even the, let, 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 let's see if ann can take it <laughs> <laughs> yes ann so you have a, a consecutive exotropia coming to you uh, what age would you intervene uh, what would you want to see or do first um um I, I i operated uh, a child at you know 1 year of age and now at 7 8 9 years of age the child is uh, coming with an exotropia of say 20 30 prisms so what would uh, i be looking for what would be the possible reasons 
one of course i messed up that i know you can't say to your examiner but that should be at the back of your mind but what are the other <laughs> non messed up reasons one we had discussed earlier also that we kind of missed the accommodative component so there may have been a small accommodative component that you could be missed for that is one the other is uh, you must do a refraction in all these because by this age they may actually start becoming myopes so if the child is not wearing glasses and the child is now become a myope they may actually go on to become an exotrope because the myopes would have a tendency so you must first do refraction you must take vision because of the refractive error the vision may be poor so they are manifesting the exotropia because of subnormal vision so you check the vision if the vision is subnormal check the refraction especially if the child is myop you prescribe them glasses and you let them come back for a, in a bit if they become intermittent exotropia is possibly because now they they are able to see better and now they are able to get their fusional versions so they become intermittent exotropes you start giving them fusional exercises and follow up and see how they are doing if they remain a divergent squint like an alternate divergent squint and there is no significant improvement in their deviation and and you can you measured you can have one follow up and see if your deviation remains more or less constant in that case you would go back and need to operate these children and again it depends i mean it's it's really whatever age they present if you've gone through this process of vision refraction and a small follow up to see that the deviation remains constant one would have to intervene irrespective of the age in fact if they are younger you may want to intervene much earlier especially if they start developing a dominant eye also look for amblyopia sometimes in infantile esotropias our methods of measuring vision are poor so we sometimes miss small amblyopias in these patients although we look for alternation but it may be sometimes difficult to confirm alter alternate strabismus in uh in a small child and be sure that each eye is fixing alternately so later on we realize when they are a little older at 4 5 years of age that they may have amblyopia and that may be responsible for the exotropia so vision if there is amblyopia refraction if there is amblyopia give amblyopia therapy everything geared to get fusion if possible because finally the fusion will lock the eyes into place like it's it's doing in you and me so that is the key intervention that we can do subsequently if all this fails you will plan for surgery very small angle you may think in terms of prisms but if it's a larger angle which is usually is as a consecutive exo you will plan surgery again depending on um, uh, on my comfort zone and if i know how much surgery, if it's my surgery and i know how much i have done i can think of revisiting the previously operated medial recti which were recessed and advance them uh, or else look at a uh, lateral recta is a fresh muscle because predictability is more once i do fresh unoperated muscle and i think in terms of getting quicker better results long standing results by doing lateral recta recession and the other thing you need to look for is to look for eye movements if there is an adduction deficit uh, in any one of the eyes it may indicate that one of the muscles which i had recessed may have slipped back so that is causing the adduction deficit then it becomes a mandatory for me to go in early and uh, uh, examine and operate on the recessed medial rectus because if that has slipped i have to bring that back in any amount of uh, lateral rectus uh, recession is not going to correct the adduction deficit it may bring about alignment in primary gaze but the adduction deficit will remain because the medial rectus is becoming hub is is weak yeah, because it is uh, at the equator or beyond so i will have to revisit medial rectus and probably advance it depending upon the amount of angle and how much it has slipped so that would be a broadly my approach for a consecutive exo uh, dr anjini anything to add uh, uh yes sir like uh, 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 generally these patients which i have seen will coming with consecutive exotropias uh, Uh, we have to uh, assess again sir i as you told we have to check the vision of the patient whether the patient is amblyopic or not and uh, uh, how much is the deviation like how much it is is it like a more like a convergence insufficiency type or it is like a more of a more for the distance so uh, we uh, i i i assess them and uh, uh, generally uh, 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 the patients 
if they generally they come after so long time that uh, we don't have the exactly. surgical records so uh, i assess them sir if it is like more for the convergence insufficiency type where i feel that the convergence is deficient or uh, the patient is having more deviation for near uh, i try to uh, give them orthoptics uh, otherwise uh, if it is for the distance then uh, we can plan it as a normal divergence excess exotropia and i take it as a divergence excess exotropia case and take it as a fresh case sir. so I, I I absolutely I guess. So, Doctor, any questions for us? Rohit, <laughs> uh, uh, that uh, yeah. uh, a, a wonderful session. I, I I normally uh, refer my uh, pediatric uh, against my uh, pediatric ophthalmologist, but I I learned a lot. Uh, uh, it's uh, it, I mean uh, discussed everything. Uh, the presentation was good. Uh, Doctor Anjani uh, is a good teacher. I mean, uh, uh, you can see from Ant's uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, all the PGs and uh, everyone who have attended this session would have learned a lot. And uh, uh, Rohit, we would like to have you uh, uh, frequently <laughs> in, our, in our session. Absolutely. Uh, absolute pleasure. Although and I hope, uh, Shri, that you will not refer your children to pediatric ophthalmologists <laughs> and you'll spend time on them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th uh, thank you, Ruth. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Shiri. Thank you. Thank you.